Hey folks, welcome back. This is the first video in a new series on causal effects. Causal effects go beyond statements like A causes B and quantifies how much a change in A will change B. In this video, we will explore a few core concepts that underlie causal effects, which will serve as a solid foundation for future videos. And with that, let's get into it. One way we can think about causal effects is going beyond answering questions of why to answering questions of how much. So for example, you might ask, why did my headache go away? Put another way, what is the reason my headache went away? What caused that? And maybe what happened was I took a pill. So the pill caused my headache to go away. But asking how much would be, what if I took two pills? How much does a unit of treatment, so how does an additional pill affect my headache? And so that's what causal effects are all about, answering this question of how much. And so before diving into the discussion on causal effects, I'm going to touch on two pieces of background information. The first being the types of variables that we see in estimating causal effects. And so the first type of variable we have is the outcome, which is the variable we're ultimately interested in. So using the same example from the previous slide, headache status. Another type of variable we have are treatment variables. And so these are the variables that we change in order to influence the outcome. So from the same example, the pill was the treatment. And so we took a pill to try to influence our outcome variable of headache status. And then we basically have everything else, which we call the covariates. And then this could be age, weight, exercise level, how often someone takes headache pills or how adapted they might be to them, uh, so on and so forth. And so the other piece of background information that we're going to talk about is this potential outcomes framework. This is a big idea in the space of causality, and it's an approach to estimating causal effects through what what if questions. So what this might look like is we have scenario one, which is what actually happens. So let's say I have a headache and I take a pill and then my headache goes away. That's scenario one. And then we can ask, what if I didn't take the pill? Would I still have a headache? What situation would I be in? So that's scenario two. So we can use this way of thinking, this scenario one, scenario two way of thinking to formulate causal effects. And so in this video, I'll talk about three different types of causal effects listed here and kind of embedded in all these different types of causal effects is the potential outcomes framework. Okay, so first we have the individual treatment effect. And so this basically quantifies the impact of treatment for a particular individual. So just like we were talking about before, scenario one, let's say me personally, specifically, I have a headache and I take a pill and then my headache goes away. But then we can imagine this what if scenario, scenario two, where I have a headache, but I didn't take the pill. I kind of turn back time to the moment just before I took the pill and just didn't. And then let's say in that scenario, my headache got a little better. And so then we can formulate this individual treatment effect or ITE for short as the difference between these two outcomes, putting this into an equation. Y is representing our outcome variable headache status. X is representing our treatment status. So X equals one represents taking a pill scenario one, and then X equals zero represents not taking the pill. So scenario two, and then and what this is representing is the outcome variable when I took the pill versus the outcome variable when I didn't take the pill. So we just take their difference and that's the individual treatment effect. But if we're trying to investigate the efficacy of this pill, we're probably not just interested in how effective it is on me, but how effective it is on the larger population. And so that's where we get into the average treatment effect, which is the expected impact of treatment for a population. So here we're going to do the same exact thing as before, but instead of just for one person, we're going to look at a bunch of people. So scenario one, we have a bunch of people with headaches, we give them pills and we measure their outcomes. Scenario two, take those same people and we do the what if scenario and then we measure their outcomes. And then just like we did for the individual treatment effects, we take a specific person's scenario one, look at the outcome subtracted by their outcome in scenario two, and then we just take the average for this broad population. 
function. We can represent this in an equation form where E is representing the expectation value and then I is indexing the subjects in this study. So what this means is we look at the I participant, we see what their outcome was in the scenario one and we subtract it by their outcome in scenario two. And then we compute the expectation value, which is just a weighted average is what we're seeing here. Okay, so we have this way of formulating causal effects through the individual treatment effect and average treatment effect. But you know, a big question here is how are we supposed to compute this when we can only really observe one of these two scenarios in practice? We don't have all the information that we need to compute the individual treatment effect or the average treatment effect. And so that brings us to the individual treatment effect in RCTs or randomized controlled trials. And so this is how we can compute an average treatment effect experimentally. So imagine that we pick out a population of people at random, and then we randomly split them into two groups. So we'll call one the experimental group, and we'll call the other the control group. And then we can do a similar kind of thing as we did before. We give half the people, the experimental group, a pill when they have a headache, and we measure their outcomes. Then we have the other half of people in the control group, and we don't give them a pill, and we measure their outcomes. But now what we do slightly differently is we compute the average outcome for each of these two groups. So we have the average outcome for the experimental group, and then we have the average outcome for the control group. And then we can compute the average treatment effect in the context of this randomized control trial as the difference between these two average outcomes. So this is probably the most common way that the average treatment effect is computed in practice through randomized control trials or something similar. And so how we can represent this in an equation is instead of having just a single expectation value, now we have two expectation values. And then J is indexing the experimental group and K is indexing the control group. So this is much easier to measure in practice than the previous equation because here we're just comparing two numbers as opposed to doing a bunch of subtractions and then computing the average. And then finally we have the average treatment effect for the treated or similarly for the controls. So what this is is the expected impact of treatment for the treated population or the control population. And so how we can express this mathematically, the average treatment effect for the treated, also called ATT, we can write it down like this. So here we have again the expectation value, which is just a weighted average. We have the outcome variable y. i is indexing our participants. So this is the outcome variable for the ith participant when they take the treatment minus the outcome variable for the ith participant when they don't take the treatment. So we can take that difference. But now we have this conditional statement. So basically what this is saying is what is the average treatment effect but conditional that the participant actually received the treatment. And so in the textbook by Morgan and Winship, they have a nice discussion about this. And an example where this might come up, the ATT, the average treatment effect for the treated, is let's say you're trying to measure the causal effect of private school versus public school on SAT scores or something. So what average treatment effect for the treated, what that study might look like is you take students that are already in private school, so the treatment variable is in private school. You split them into two groups where one of them, you keep them in private school and the other group, you send them to public school. And then you can measure their SAT scores, compute the average, and then compute the difference. Conversely, for the same example, you can do the average treatment effect for the controls. You do a very similar study where you split your population into two groups, the treatment group and the control group. But the only difference here is instead of taking a population of private school students for your study, you take a population of public school students for your study. And so generally these values, these average treatment effects will be different for the two different populations. So if your kid already goes to private school, you're probably more interested in the average treatment effect for the treated as opposed to the overall average treatment effect. So in this video, we talked about three different types of causal effects, which are all based on this potential outcomes framework, which essentially works by comparing the outcomes of what you actually measure to a what if scenario that you don't measure. But there's some practical concerns with this way of doing things. So how are we supposed to deal with all these counterfactual terms? How are we supposed to deal with all these what if scenarios in practice? So we saw that we could do a randomized controlled trial, but are
are we limited to just doing those kinds of studies? What about observational data? Randomized controlled trials and things like it are expensive, not just in cost, but in effort. You need researchers, you need protocols, you need IRBs. It takes a lot of effort to manage these kinds of studies. However, observational data, this is just data that we can passively observe. This kind of data is much more prevalent than data from randomized controlled trials. It would be very advantageous if we can use this data to compute causal effects. And then finally, what kind of software tools are available for this stuff? So in the next video of the series, I'm going to touch on all these different questions and discuss three different kinds of practical techniques for computing causal effects from observational data. And so if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, or sharing this content. If you have questions, please share those in the comments section below. I learn a lot from the questions I receive in the comments section. And as always, thanks for your time and thanks for watching.